Hi, nice to meet all of you today. And um, so the, the, the chamber engaged us about five or six months ago to take a look at the um, Christos Massasoit um, Conference Center site, which right now is there's a pad on one site, which is the um, former Christos, and then, and then we have the um, um, now unused conference center um, on the other side. So we've, we've been asked to take a look at, you know, kind of very, very, um, you know, at a summary level, what options for redevelopment are for this particular site. And um, so the way that, um, the, the goal of this project is um, to look at the characteristics, the actual physical characteristics of the site. And then we follow it by looking at the context of the, the site, meaning what the, um, economic and demographic variables are for Brockton. You, whenever um, you have like development opportunities, they're not done in a void. You have to know kind of a little bit of the data that surround it. And then we have like an exploration of options. We conducted numerous interviews actually with several of the people here about what possible uses would be for the two sites or combined sites. And then um, we looked at the um, path, actual pathways um, that would be, would be needed to actually redevelop the site. And then we, we do have um, Addie Bladdock here from DCAM, and, and DCAM is a big part of what you know, the pathways are because they're the ones who right now control the sites. So um, as, our, as I already mentioned, this is a, about a six acre site at the corner of Crescent and Quincy with um, Burl Avenue um, running down the, the middle. In terms of the recent history, so a lot of you, I'm not a local, but people know that Christos, kind of like a venerated um, Greek restaurant, closed in 2013. And then initially that was thought to be um, turned into like an allied health center uh, affiliated with um, Massasoit Community College. But I think a, a change of priorities with the new um, administration made it so that project did not take off because I think the priority changed to more like let's fix what we have we're seeing that now with the state's transportation system i think it's a similar mentality to with the um with in terms of the allied health center um not not occurring and um and then um following the you know so that was taken down and then um and very recently the other building the um the conference center at massasoit has also been closed it's leaving the city with quite a, um, a large unused site at this point. In terms of its um, you know, location, it is, it just came up, that it is at the gateway to the east. Brockton has you know, very good and for maybe better known access on the west side because of 24 and um, with more traffic coming in that way, but this is the way to get to Massasoit from the east and from the, um, from the outlying um, eastern suburbs. Um, it is, as I mentioned before, it is bisected by Bureau Avenue. And we actually um, spoke with um, Rob May earlier to say what has to happen if you um, wanted to um, turn it into like a single parcel, which would mean that you'd have to close down um, Burl Avenue. And um, Rob mentioned that that can be done, um, have to be approved by the city council um, to close that particular right of way. And then the parcels would then essentially, their line is of being a bureau would go to the, um, at the side of your old sidewalk, if there was a sidewalk, would actually go to the center line. And um, currently it is under the jurisdiction of, of DCAM. Now in terms of looking at its future, um, in terms of decision making, whether it is housing or commercial development hotel development, retail, um, you name it, the, one of the first things that people look at, what are the demographics and the economics? And um, so we took a look at some of the kind of major variables that people consider when they look at um, site locations. And I'll go, some of them may be familiar to you already, some may not, or some may just represent updates for you. But in terms of um, um, population growth, and that's probably the number one variable that will come up before anything else. Um, Brockton is the um, kind of the serrated dashed line. Plymouth um, County is the blue, 
Massachusetts is green, the United States is on the top. And um, so this is an index growth rate, 2010 to 2017. And a takeaway from this is that, um, I'm not sure people realize this, but Massachusetts right now is the fastest growing state in the Northeast. So to find a faster growing state, you have to go to the west to Minnesota, south to, to Delaware. So you look at the entire Northeast quadrant, we're pretty fast growing. That is not the way we were in the, um, in the knots when the state was barely growing at all. And it's actually, we're growing fast enough now that we've had to redo a lot of our projections because if any projection was based on 2008 <coughs> data or 2009, it's gonna be coming in low likely. But even though Brockton is growing um, more slowly, um, the city itself is growing and it is participating you know, in the state and the region's growth. Now looking at the um, neighboring t towns, um, the whole area, and if you look at all the, um, like Abington through Whitman, it's, it's the area is essentially growing at a similar rate as the state. And, um, and as I just mentioned too about like Brockton, is growing so it is what you know if you, if you classify it it's like a gateway city in Massachusetts if you look nationally it would be considered kind of a, a post-industrial city and a lot of you know post-industrial cities like you know Anderson Indiana or Youngstown Ohio or, or Flint Michigan a lot of the ones in upstate New York they're facing you know population decline you know which just kind of makes it so that um, problems actually snowball because you have building abandonment and then housing abandonment. I mean, so Brockton has a, is still, you know, has a growth dynamic, which you know, longer term will help it, you know, both in terms of attracting employers as well as um, for being able to justify the building of new housing. This is um, the age distribution for Brockton. I think the, the takeaway here is that Brockton is significantly younger than um, the state and the national average, and it's significantly um, younger than its neighboring towns, with 26% um, of the population below the age of 18. And, um, and something that will come up a little bit later when I talk a little bit more about senior housing is that um, the largest segment of the population, though, even though it's smaller than um, for the um, United States, Massachusetts, or the other towns, is this 40 to 64 group and this 40 to 64 group that's what it is currently is going to be moving in that very large group is going to be moving into that 65 years and older group in the coming decade and that has a lot of implications for labor as well as for for housing now in terms of jobs growth um, Brockton Massachusetts is also the fastest growing state in terms of jobs growth since 2010 in, in the Northeast, and um, with 12.5% growth over since 2010. And Brockton's a little bit slower, and, and so is the region, but it's still a growth city, adding, you know, having recovered from the previous Great Recession, and it is growing. So again, it's another variable that kind of bodes well, you know, um, longer term for the city to be kind of attractive for, um, for any, for, again, housing or, or employers. Looking at the, um, at the um, where people work and live, this right here shows um, the left arrow is the 25,000. There's the number of people who are coming into Brockton to work on a given day. The 9,500 is the number of people who reside in Brockton and work in Brockton. And then the, the 33,600 are the people who live here and, um, and then work elsewhere. So basically Brockton is kind of like a, a net kind of exporter of jobs in the region. So we have maybe, um, we have a lot of people who live here and then they actually commute elsewhere um, to work, perhaps because the, some of the living costs are lower, I'm not sure exactly what the dynamic is, but it is a place where people live and then they go, go elsewhere um, to work and, and maybe strategically, you know, this I could help along with other initiatives clearly could help to make it so there are actually more jobs so people don't have to go as far. In terms of um, the sectoral growth, um, so the, the um, employment change by industry. 
not, not a surprise, um, and because this is consistent with what we see also for, for Massachusetts, um, healthcare, which is on the left, is the, um, the largest growth industry <coughs> right now in the city. And, um, but in other takeaways, besides healthcare being a growth industry like it is all over the country and in Massachusetts, is if you look at the other sectors, like retail trade is kind of large in manufacturing, um, the city is you know, seeing you know, fairly diverse growth, or at least the industry is holding fairly steady. And the fact that manufacturing has actually even added some jobs in the past seven years is, is a positive also, because that does not hold true among many places, to be able to maintain where those you know, generally higher um, wage level type jobs that people might not necessarily need to have is like a you know, four year degree or higher to have. So after looking at jobs and population, income levels also have clearly been bearing in both the, the housing and, and labor market. Um, yeah, Brockton is, people know, is like, it is generally a lower income city and um, with lower income levels than the state or the United States overall, but it's not, um, it's about 8,000 below the United States average. So it's not super low, but it is, um, lower than it is for the, um, yeah, than, than the average is. But interestingly, I find that when we're talking about the east side of Brockton, that, um, that Abington, um, East Bridgewater, and Whitman, they all have relatively higher um, income levels. So those suburbs, if you want to call it that, um, could also be kind of a, you know, a, a draw for this particular um, site. And, and just as I was talking about the, um, the income levels in Hesperian housing, the, the poverty rates also in Brockton are relatively higher also than the statewide or national averages. But again, like income, it's not like, not like the income was like way below, the poverty levels also are not way higher either, especially compared to the United States. And, um, and then um, housing costs, this has, well, I talk a little bit more about the senior housing option a little bit later. Um, the, you know, right now, the single family home is $271,000. And what's kind of interesting about that is um, it's a fairly significant amount of money. And there are a lot of seniors holding on to homes that are, you know, they're worth something. And these are the type of people that can't afford um, to be able to move and want to move into some sort of a different type of a housing in, in the future. So, um, so those are kind of like the background demographics and economics of the, of the city and the area. And um, our next step was we conducted um, some independent research as well as many interviews with stakeholders in Brockton to get perspectives about what would be suitable um, for this particular site. And, um, and we haven't like, we don't necessarily have these like ranked, but here are some sectors that are part of the discussion and ones that we you know, can't say that this is the one you should go with yet, you know, but the, um, the sectors that were discussed frequently were, and I'm gonna, I'll go and talk in a little bit more detail about each one of these, is um, retail, then multifamily housing, senior supportive housing, um, green space amenities, like the conversion of maybe into a little bit more sort of a park space, and then um, and then some that came up not frequently, but we thought we were the mention, mentioning, which are um, life sciences, um, medical, and hotel. And retail is like an important thing to talk about because the existing use right next to the site is a shopping area. And so I think it's a natural to think that maybe retail would, would have a fit. And so we um, took, looked at the um, location requirements for a couple <coughs> things that came up. This doesn't necessarily mean that's what should go there, but when you're, um, when you're thinking about like the use of a large site, one possibility you know, would be a, a Walmart type um, large facility 
which requires um, a lot of parking, you know, a lot of acreage, and um, and so then then Walmart's also tend to um, go to secondary sites. They're they're more willing than some other retailers to go to secondary sites, but th but then given that there's one in Abington and then one on the other side of Brockton and then in Avon, yeah, you know, maybe not. Yeah, but the point really is is that this site is large enough, you know, if the city wanted to go down that path to be able to accommodate that type of a of a place. And then another one that you know, came up in interviews, and then we only subsequently found out because I think it was only recently announced was, um, and this is again as an example of a of a fast food type of a place that would um, requires a pretty big space. So we looked at um, you know Chick Fil A as an example, you know of, of what they look for in the site, and you can probably um, you can think about any other similar type. Food place, and it would be likely, you know, be be similar. Is so that they, they do have like proprietary systems for locating a site, um, and um, they want high traffic areas, which this has about sixteen thousand cars per day, and um, and they need a lot of space, and so it might it's not going to be a Chick Fil A necessarily that would go there, especially now that they're at Westgate, but in terms of um, what they're considering, um, um, other fast food type places would would have similar um, site location decision making, and this right here we is the siting of um, current Chick Fil A's with you now one being in Brockton. They tend to want to make sure that they're not competing, you know, with each other, and so they keep their their distances. And um, so, in terms of like our our group of stakeholders that we spoke to, um, I would say that retail really came. Almost no one really said that retail is the way to go, or at least not yet. With the sense that Brockton is like um, over retailed, there are already um, vacancies, and there's not necessarily a an adequate market, at least on that side, for the for the way it is. Currently, but um, housing did come up um, much more frequently as kind of like what would be um, likely to be more suitable for the site. So, um, so um, senior supportive housing um, came up with, with many of the people that we spoke to. Um, right now, in Brockton, 50% um, of 54% um, of householders who are 65 and older. Are living in a single-family home, so those are going to be turning over at some point, and, the, and so those people are going to be likely needing to make some sort of a move with uh, various levels of assisted housing because it's it's tiered, and um, so there will be some decisions that will be made regarding that, and some of with you know some of it's when the seniors leave to go to move to a different place. A benefit to that, and we see that we've seen this in other suburbs of Boston, is it does open up housing for millennials and younger people who really want to be able to enter the market. But right now, a lot of these homes are being held or owned by um, 65 plus um, people. And um, looking, at, and there will be a real need for senior housing looking in the future. This right here, the blue line, is what the um, structure, the age distribution was of Brockton's population in 2010. And the green is the projection of Brockton's age structure for 2030. And so basically your younger working age is going to be going um, down between 2010 and 2030. This, this right here is roughly the 40 to 54 group. And then you can see an even more dramatic increase in the people who are between the ages of like 60 and, and, and 80, which are captured more in this area. So there's going to be a strong housing need for these people who are shifting from single family or living independently to, um, to living in 
more of an assisted housing type of an environment. And another advantage, uh, so in terms of um, this would also like um, senior housing is com complementary to um, to healthcare, and so um, so we could have more healthcare workers, and then also with the Massasoit tie with the um, with the nursing school um, by having proximate um, senior housing to their you know, could and that came up too is there could be a complementary. Um, ways to be able to align, you know, the nursing school with the needs of senior housing, people living in senior housing, um, r residential complex that's literally like at Massasoit's um, back door. <coughs> and this um, it's an article that just came out of the Boston Globe, and um, and this ties back to like many seniors being able to sell their homes for a fair amount of. Um, money um, that um, th there will be a need for seniors for a middle group of seniors to have some level of um, <coughs> affordable housing that where where there are people who are not on the high end who already have plenty of money in their retirement accounts mm -hmm. and then they won't but but have too much money to get the government assistance on the other so possibly some more middle income level um, or limited assistance um, would would work in terms of adding senior housing at this location. And um, beyond senior housing and more generally um, multifamily housing, looking at the um, particular site, um, moving from north to south, it would be possible to have maybe kind of a, a tiered system where you have like lower density more on the northern part and then work your way towards crescent on the south with a higher density so we're talking like maybe you know townhomes type complexes on the north to maybe having more like four-story type apartments on the south of the crescent and, and quincy um, type of area the area does it full of amenities that um, um the school itself there is an art gallery and a theater and a benefit to having increased housing and more people in that area is that if there is a desire for more retail and more kind of restaurants, um, and including, and it comes up fairly frequently, with the experiential type of um, restaurants and retail, meaning like coffee roasters, breweries, and um, studio, yoga studios, and things like that, this sort of a population would help to support kind of a more of an experiential restaurant and retail scene, which is the direction that we're seeing a lot of successful complexes go, and a type of an amenity that many um, areas are, are seeking, which I think Brockton is already putting heavy emphasis on that for its downtown area right now in particular. And um, yeah, other options that came up that I mentioned, I'm not sure how well the necessarily work or like um, life sciences related development. Um, Boston Cambridge is like the, it really is the global epicenter of biotech and life sciences and different suburban locations have seen some, some growth um, because of that. And, and um, it, there's a lot of Marlboro and I forget the name of it, there's one, uh, and there's Anilime or Nylum is down, um, has a factory down in the southeast. And this area would not be suitable for factory, but in terms of like tech space or office space, because um, Boston Cambridge is so expensive and we're already seeing kind of a movement um, of biotechs and, uh, and much of their lab space and office space to places like, like Waltham and other places around the Boston area. So there could possibly be a way to kind of latch on to the, this wave of growth that, that Boston is seeing in, in life sciences. And um, I've already talked a little bit about the medical services side um, being linked to um, some sort of a senior housing, but in terms of the actual, um, you know, the hospitals in the city actually have more closely located um, 
office possibilities than this side. So it might not necessarily have a real tight tie to a hospital, but there could still be COVID medical services option. Also, and then hotel came up too. The, um, the area is very underserved um, by hotels and motels. And the, the site is large enough to, um, to accommodate like a, like a probably 150 to 200 room hotel. And um, the hotel would, um, we did some kind of back of the envelope, I mean, based on real data calculations, but between property tax and local option room taxes, because Brockton does have a local option room tax, um, tax of 6%, you know, a 150 room hotel at 70% vacancy could generate about $600,000 a year in property taxes as, and, um, and, and room taxes. Now, for, for any of this to happen, and this also comes from the planning literature as well as a clear knowledge of it from people that we interviewed, is the area does need some placemaking improvements both in terms of um, st like streetscaping, it needs like curbing and landscaping in order to make it more attractive. And there's already an existing um, um, intersection improvement that's slated for the area because the, the, um, the traffic problem, the safety it, is an issue. So before anything else can actually take place, this streetscaping and transportation improvements it's kind of like a, a, a some some that actually has to take place first. And I already just talked about the transportation. So, so those are the options that came up through interviews and some of our own research. The demographic profile for Brockton and the um, site characteristics. And I'm going to have Gail is going to talk about some of the um, the tools and challenges you know, for developing the site and, and a pathway forward. So there are a lot of tools, um, state and federal level tools, that can be used to help finance some sort of development project. Um, it's, although there are three opportunity zones in Brockton, this site is not in an opportunity zone. So although that's the one uh, right now that's getting a lot of buzz, there are still other programs um, that could be used for redeveloping the site. So we've got TIF financing, which is a public financing method that helps um, finance these projects. You could also, also, you know, all of these are not necessarily just one-offs. Some of these, these are just some examples, but they can also be stacked um, and used in combination with one another to help finance a pro, um, project, whatever it might be, along with uh, private development dollars. So you've also got New Markets Tax Credit Program, um, which, helps bring in economic development to what they call economically distressed areas. There was one of these um, new tax, new market tax credit uh, used for a development project in Brockton already, downtown. Um, the Housing Development Incentive Program is a program specifically uh, <coughs> tailored for gateway cities, so that's another one that could be used, as well as the MassWorks Infrastructure Program, which is a competitive grants program uh, that helps fund developments that are for either uh, job growth or housing and, and moving housing along. That's one of, obviously, the state's priorities. In terms of challenges, this, the site does have some challenges. The main sort of challenges are that construction costs, which is a problem all over the state, but you know, construction costs may make it really difficult to have a completely market rate uh, development. So whether you're using some sort of market rate housing with certain a certain amount of units that are specifically for uh, an age-restricted population and using some sort of government subsidies for senior housing for those units uh, or something else, not necessarily quote-unquote affordable housing, which I think gets a bad rap, but some sort of subsidized might help such a large project. Um, the site is also, you know, just outside of the reach of downtown, but it's not convenient to get to from a commuter rail site, although there is the BAT bus system. Um, it's also, you know, not off a highway, an immediately large highway. 
Um, so that would probably nix <coughs> any sort of idea for office space because it's just, just inconvenient enough to get to uh, that it might be difficult as well as cause traffic problems in the area. Um, and then going through the DCAM sale process can be lengthy. Uh, there are ways to speed it up and most of that includes legislator, state, and city rep buy-in, um, but the process generally is pretty lengthy to dispose of the site. So the process, there are a couple different ways, there's no sort of cookie cutter way of disposing the site that is under DCAM's control, uh, which this site is, but you need a legislative bill to be passed uh, for the disposition of the site and for uh, Massasoit to retain the proceeds of the sale. So generally, um, a local rep, a state rep, would have to introduce a bill to the legislature, and it should be uh, open-ended enough that it can be responsive to the college's needs, right? So you're not gonna pass a legislation that says we are going to build this site with a, any sort of specific idea in mind, but it's gonna be uh, written broadly enough that although you may already have an idea, um, that it would be responsive if, you know, if any sort of hiccup comes up. So there's kind of three main ways that DCAM disposes of site. One is the property auction. This is the fastest uh, way to do it, and it's obviously sold to the highest bidder. There is a site uh, that's up for auction right now in Chelmsford that's a, a lot bigger than this site currently, but um, that's one example of that. The RFP uh, process, there's currently a small building or a smaller <coughs> size building uh, in New Bedford that's open for the RFP project uh, pr proposal process uh, through that. And then the sale partnership program, which is more, it's a newer program, uh, and DCAM would sell the land to, in this case, Brockton, uh, and then the city would dispose of it. So the municipality, there would be, through the legislation, a deal kind of made out, you know, DCAM sells to Brockton for a dollar, whatever it might be, um, and then the city markets the site. So the net proceeds are then shared between DCAM and the city. So one example of this is this happened in 2017. There was a state <coughs> hospital in <coughs> Reading that um, the town approached a state rep and asked them to, to work out this deal with DCAM. They were able to, then they sold 32 acre site for $30 million to a developer who's now building 450 age restricted market rate condos. Uh, and from that sale, the town retained $20 million of it, and then DCAM or the Commonwealth received $9 million after all of the other expenses. Um, but one of the things that is really crucial to this sort of avenue is you need to have state reps uh, and local administrators as well really pushing for this to make sure that it doesn't get lost in the overall legislative shuffle uh, because otherwise you know there's the potential for losing interest from whatever private partnership you might have uh, developing that land yeah and this was to um, to wrap up some of the strategic steps needed to develop the site beyond the, <coughs> the DCAM disposition that this could be part of the DCAM disposition is this right here is kind of I put together an example of next steps kind of moving towards a housing option but it doesn't necessarily have to be you know the housing option but it's basically developing the you know the shared vision uh, for the site including use and design um, and then developing you know the comprehensive plan for the site um, and then as kind of an upfront investment the investment in, um, in some streetscaping and the transportation improvements through the um, intersection and then identifying the applicable and, and moving them in process um, state and federal funding that would have, um, that could apply to the site and and then with those building blocks kind of in place then the actual project can occur and so like if it is housing you know in this case like a, a senior housing or multifamily housing that could be put in and then following that with having you know, maybe you know, 200 or 250 units, whether it is for multifamily or seniors, then you'd have the housing density that would then in effect attract the retailers and the restaurants. So, so it's like, um, so as a, opposed to just like a general retail strategy, this right here would 
put your people in place that you need to be able to sustain more of the, the retail um, activity. Questions? I knew Ray was going to have a question. Right. <laughs> just, just from a public policy point of view, I have a couple of comments. In terms of the negotiating with the value of the city to try to buy this, do you think that the Commonwealth has any obligation in recognizing that it took a parcel that was economically viable to pay property taxes and took it off the property tax roll? So it actually injured, it actually inter, you know, it injured the community from that perspective. And then the second is, do you think that your report can add uh, any of those elements that the administration is supporting in terms of 135,000 new housing units, in terms of it's kind of missing in your linkage there of things you can do in terms of, you know, the governor is out there, the legislature is out there, the Senate president is out there talking about housing. And there are some bills that are being filed. Do you think that your report might be strengthened by noting some of those things? consumption for absolutely yeah in fact um, linking this to state priorities what you mentioned that would be housing um, right. would yeah would would definitely and be, if you were to do it in the same slide recognizing Christo has generated this much in property taxes over the course of the years this and when the Commonwealth took that property and basically laid it fallow yeah right? um, it cost the community Five hundred thousand, six hundred, a million dollars. That the Commonwealth has an obligation to try to make the community whole because it didn't deliver upon its promise to develop that for whatever reason. And there are probably very valid reasons, but you put that on the same slide and then say, "Now, Governor, now Commonwealth, you have this housing initiative. Let's tie the two together. It's a mea culpa all the money you took out of the city of Brockton, and then now you can help make it right." This is excellent. Okay. Well, that's not too hard to add in. So. <clears throat> Maybe we have time for one more question. If anybody has one. Uh, Rob, would you like to? Sure. <laughs> um, among the thousand other projects that I have on my plate, with no staff, um, we are looking at um, working with Mass Housing Partnership who has access to funding for the uh, uh, Urban Land Institute's technical assistance um, panels. Uh, so it's ULI CAP. Um, we want to um, uh, really have a, a, a good idea of what the mix of the property is going to be and to you know, what the end use mix is going to be and also to build some support because there's going to have to be a rezoning effort here. And um, whatever that end land use is going to be, it, it, we need to build you know, a, a strong case for that. Um, so using Co-Urbanize and, and other um, online programs, we, you know, we want to fill that out and, and, and have that ready before we go forward. Okay. And then, Abby, uh, you're from DCAM. Uh, have you been given marching orders uh, relative to this property? Has anything that was mentioned by uh, Ray been mentioned to you in terms of uh, fix it first? Uh, that seems like that was the whole philosophy behind having this property not move forward at the Allied Health Building. But is there another set of priorities now driving you? Yeah, sure. So I, maybe I can talk a little bit about the, the higher and capital planning context that this is all happening in. So I, I work in the real estate uh, arm of DCAM, the much larger arm of DCAM does um, planning, design, and construction for capital projects across the Commonwealth. And, um, uh, and, and so recently, kind of in support of this Fix It First idea, um, has gone through a, 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 a rigorous and strategic process to um, try to address some of these huge uh, needs on campuses. So uh, at, the, at Massasoit Community College, their big need right now is around science labs. Uh, science labs and then satellite health space because, uh, the, because of the projects that were shelved. Um, and so, so folks on, in our planning team are, are working with the college on, um, uh, on, on kind of designing those. And so my, uh, so, and, and so, so on, from the real estate side, we're, we're working on behalf of the college here. And so the, the college's desire is to, um, 
take whatever the proceeds are from the sales of these sites and you know combine them with other capital funds that are coming in from the Commonwealth in order to help realize those on-campus capital projects. So you know we're not we're not real estate speculators here. We're not kind of just looking up to, to flip properties or whatever. We're really the the goal is reinvestment in the on-campus programs. And so of the three options that were laid out in terms of how DCAM uh, disposes of property, is there one that you're kind of pursuing? Um, so I'm not sure. So we're working with the college on uh, on legislation right now. I'm not sh and and to um, to the to Brenner's point, the the goal with the legislation is to be as op open ended as possible, so that uh, we can be kind of responsive to whatever uh, the market demands are. Um, the I, I'm not sure we could do the sales partnership under this model. Um, but but other than that, I, I no, I, I think you know we're going to need to do more homework, more research, um, you know, kind of better understand who the potential buyers are and what what their pathways might be. Understand what the city's planning and, and potential rezoning process is and what a timeline is for that, and whether or not we want to wait for that to conclude before moving forward, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of a lot of variables at this point. But again, you know, we're really doing it on behalf of the college in order for the college to. Um, realize their goals around capital planning, as I said before, but also around being good neighbors, you know, having, um, supporting the economic development of the area, et cetera. Is your role any different for the former Christo site compared to the former Massasoit Conference Center site? No, I don't think your so. Your role is the same for both? Yeah. Okay, you're the owner of both. Uh, the Commonwealth is the owner of both. It's under the care and control of the college currently. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then Borough Avenue falls in the center. So that's a third piece, which is owned in essence by the city of mm -hmm. Brockton, and uh, there's a process by which that would be disposed of, I guess. Um, could be vacated, yes. Could be vacated. Could it be turned over to DCAM so that the whole package, all three parcels, could be marketed together? It is possible. That's one of the things that we've been negotiating with DCAM. Uh, we're not really excited about a uh, the auction disposition process. The highest, we we want to figure out what the highest and best use is, and and. Um, what the marketability of that use is so that um, we have some control uh, and we don't end up with a Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> Another Chick-fil-A. <laughs> uh, not happy with the one we have. <laughs> are, there, are there other, yeah, Pat? Uh, part of your analysis, uh, looking at the best use for that site, uh, I, I didn't see anything mentioned about medical opportunities there since the uh, health of medical was one of the highest thing in the city of Brockton that would complement maybe signature health and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, I think one of the um, one of the things that came up in some of our, our interviews was that specific medical offices might not necessarily be the best use of that land because they might, you know, doctors, it might be difficult to fill because doctors might already be affiliated with one or both hospitals. Um, but I think there is a certain amount of it, you know, in the senior supportive housing, there is an idea that we heard um, that talked about maybe that, that first floor being some sort of supportive, not necessarily doctor's offices, but some sort of supportive health-related um, services on the first floor, as well as, you know, staffing for the entire building, which could also then uh, tie back into Massasoit and their nursing school, and they're also starting a CNA pro um, program, so, uh, all of that, I think, in our report will be a little bit more explicit. We kind of rushed through it here, but I think there definitely is um, a way to, to tie that in because certainly there is the, the workforce here. Um, as, as we discussed, we have medical office buildings in the city, you know, right across the street from the two hospitals that we can't fill. Uh, we have retail, uh, you know, I've always said that we're over retail, uh, which is why we have a lot of hair salons, nail um, salons, because there's not enough rent um, being generated uh, or demand to raise the rent. Uh, so adding more of a particular category without having a whole package deal really doesn't make you know, sense. Well, thank you. Thank you to our speakers and to DCAM for being here as well. Let's uh, give them a